Um, how to have a healthy ambition. How to have a healthy ambition is the title I've chosen to talk about Psalm 127 today. Um, ambition is an important topic. Uh, my ambition at the moment, or one of my main ambitions at the moment, is to get out of this period of lockdown uh, still sane. Um, and you may feel the same. For some of us, our ambition is to please get our children back to school as soon as possible. Uh, for some of us, perhaps the ambition is to find meaningful work. Uh, Tunde, sorry to hear about your contract ending. That must be challenging. I know Stefan's still looking for work, and we've got to keep you know each other in our prayers here. There are significant ambitions. Let me ask a pose a question. You can um, unmute yourself, or you can stick something in the chat box. First question for the day: Why is ambition important? To get somewhere. You get somewhere. Thank you, Elsie. You do. Without ambition, you're not likely to get somewhere. Chantel, thank you. Sense of direction. Yeah, ambition gives you that. You're going somewhere, aren't you? Same kind of idea. Other ideas? Anybody else? Why is it important? Yeah, so I think uh, kind of the opposite of, not the opposite, but the flip side of the coin that I see people are po posting, it drives you forward, sense of direction, gives you a sense of purpose, gives you goals. I see Garth and Lizzie are posting opposite side of it is I've, I've I've found that there's been times where I lack ambition or I'm not sure of my ambition it's actually kind of demotivating and it's uh, I get passive and idle and it opens up temptation it opens up uh, discouragement and all kinds of it's kind of a almost a negative cycle a lack of ambition Right, so there's the flip side of what the problem is. There's a problem of not having it, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as there's a positive side of having it. Gives you goals, gives you a sense of purpose. Bill, thanks, drive you forward. Yeah, Simon, plans to prosper. Motivation for living. Well, yeah, excellent. Excellent. I think we need ambition. Let me, I mean, you know, we're, we're thinking, the world is thinking a lot. Oh, hang on, Mulligan said it motivates you. Yes, yes, absolutely. We're thinking a lot at the moment about justice and injustice because of the Black Lives Matter things and to do with George Floyd's death and much bigger than just that. Um, we, we will hope to see greater sense of justice and less injustice. It's good to have an ambition for those kinds of things. Okay, second question for the day. Who are some of the most ambitious people you can think of, either alive or dead, all right, in the in past, in the history, the history in the past or, or currently alive? Who are some of the most ambitious people? But what? Who comes to mind when you think about really ambitious people? Yeah. I couldn't hear that. Who is that? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think he's an ambitious chap. I'd agree with that. Yes. I've got, I've got a very controversial one. Go on, Dan. Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Gosh, he, well, you're right. He was ambitious. Yes. Cliff Boris, Richard. someone says, yeah. Bill? Cliff Richard. Cliff Richard, a very ambitious person. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Saw him live once at the NEC in Birmingham. Yeah. 30 odd years ago. Elon Musk. Yes. Michael Jackson. Yeah. That's it. Ernest Shackleton. Now you're talking my. Uh, Oh my, Evia! You know about Ernest Shackleton? That he's one of my top heroes ever. We got to talk about that sometime. <sighs> I knew someone who used to know his son, uh, one of Penny's re Penny's relatives. Um, Obama, yeah. David Beckham, Oprah Winfrey, Mandela. Okay, he was on my list. Yeah, Liesl. Yeah, sorry, Bill. You had another Ronaldo. one. Ronaldo. 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 Yeah. Bill, you had another one, did you? Yeah, Lord Paul. I can't remember his first name. He's the runner. Oh, from Chariots of Fire? No, no, no. Um, oh, Sebastian Coe. Oh, Sebastian, Sebastian Coe. Yeah. Sorry, right. Okay, yes. Yeah. So Edmund Hillary, yes. Alexander Hamilton. Wow. Okay, yes. yeah. We got some names here. This is great. David Williams. Yeah, yeah. Ambitious people. Did somebody say Lewis Hamilton? No, Alexander Hamilton. 
Lewis Hamilton certainly you, has. You it. could add Lewis yeah, to that. Eddie is hard. Eddie is hard. <laughs> <laughs> he did, He's he did a like a marathon every day for like 26 days. Yeah, that's like true. That. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, that, that, the drive that must take. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that certain people spring to mind? I mean, there are lots of people who are ambitious. And in fact, almost everybody in, on some level is ambitious, but some people stand out with their ambition. Um, I think of Bill Gates and his desire to eliminate malaria. Who knows if it'll, it'll happen, but uh, what a noble ambition. Uh, Mother Teresa, on a very different level, her ambition to serve the poor in uh, what was Calcutta. Um, someone's mentioned Mandela. Gandhi had a vision for an, a united Indian nation, an incredible ambition. Um, one of mine, my sort of ambitious heroes that I've come to know more about this year is a chap called Dr. Paul Brand. I read his autobiography, sort of uh, co-written with Philip Yancey on here, uh, Fearfully and Wonderfully, the, the Marvel of Bearing God's Image. It's a wonderful book, but it, Dr. Paul Brown, Brand was one of the pioneers of figuring out what was going on with leprosy. He lived in India um, and developed procedures for um, helping people with their, um, uh, their the damage to their limbs because of um, because of leprosy and pioneered breakthroughs in the field of treating leprosy and preventing it. It was his life's ambition to eliminate uh, um, uh, leprosy as a disease that, um, uh, and it's a, an amazing thing. And I, we, we, we do have examples of misplaced ambition, but we also have so many examples of well-directed ambition. Just because we have ambition doesn't mean it'll be well directed. And I think that's what a lot of what this psalm is dealing with is helping us to have a well directed ambition. If you think about it, I would say the most ambitious person who ever lived on this earth was Jesus himself. His ambition was to bring God's love to the whole of humankind. I don't think you can have a, a more ambitious aim than that. And so if we're following Jesus, we are by nature people of ambition. There's no such thing, in my estimation, as an unambitious Christian. That can't be the case. If we're following the most ambitious person toward the earth and we want to be more like him, it means we, we, we can grow in a healthy ambition. How do we do that? Let's, let's take a few thoughts from this psalm. What we're looking at here is that the psalmist is using family as the vehicle to talk about ambition. So the psalm talks a lot about family. It is about family, but it's about more than just family. And because of that, even those of us who don't have children uh, yet or they've left the home, it doesn't mean it's not about you when it talks about family and children here because it's about the bigger picture. It applies to, to all of us in one way or another. So we'll talk about two things. Firstly, from verses 1 and 2, let's just go back to the passage here for a moment. Um, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain, unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early, stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. So we'll focus on these two verses just for a moment. I think what he's getting at here is life and ambition is about having an ambition to be within and enjoying the love of God more than it is to have an ambition about stuff and achievements. The end of verse 2, he grants sleep to those he loves. This doesn't mean he will only grant sleep to a few people as if he selected only a few people to love because God loves all people. I think what he's really saying here is those of us who are connected to his love will find that we get this peace, we get this contentment, we get this ability to enjoy him and therefore enjoy what he's given us. And that's more significant than what we try to achieve. Now, what the, the psalmist is talking about is areas of achievement that are perfectly natural and important. Uh, building a house, watching over a city, um, toiling for food. Nothing wrong with any of those things. The home, the city, and food are the basics of security. Um, and bear in mind, in the first century and some parts of the world today, uh, there was no home insurance for your house in Israel at that time, there was no police force or army to protect you in the way that we would have today from bandits. Um, there was no benefits system to protect us and hold us in cases of scarcity and famine. 
um, they had a very much hand to mouth existence. For a lot of people in those days, <clears throat> they only ate if they worked. If they worked that day, they ate. If they didn't eat work that day, they didn't eat. Most of us don't don't have that kind of challenge, fortunately, but we do have a challenge to to try and, and, and provide for our families and for ourselves. And we have the challenge of how we feel about the challenges with that and the possibility of scarcity. He's not saying we shouldn't work hard and provide for our family. First Timothy chapter five and verse eight says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So we're not talking about not providing. We're talking about the tension of, of taking it all into our own hands without God. And we're talking about the danger of letting that be our focus and not letting and not being in a place to be able to enjoy our relationship with God. Humility and generosity, I think, are what he's talking about here. Generosity, because and what we've been given is meant to be shared, not hoarded. We know the warnings about that, like the parable of the man who built bigger barns rather than uh, being right with God. Or in James chapter 3, he says this in verse 16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Um, selfish ambition is the ambition that hoards as opposed to a spiritual ambition, which is the ambition to bless others with what we what we are given, what we achieve, what we acquire. Generosity is the mark, or one of the marks, of someone with healthy ambition. Now, I don't know about you, I didn't grow up um, being very generous. I wasn't a generous person growing up. I have to say, I think most of my adult life, I've struggled with being generous. I don't feel it very easy to be generous with my time, my energy, my money, um i i find it i find it difficult to give things away in that sense to give of myself i'm the kind of person who sees the phone ring and thinks mm, do i have to answer it rather than oh who's ringing it'll be let me find out what's going on I, i'm like mm, I'm a, i don't know do i have to um i i try to deal with that in prayer and you know and if you ring me and i don't pick up please don't take it personally um but i i just struggle with this stuff and I find generosity difficult. And that's a sign for me that there's maybe a bit of selfish ambition in me. I want to protect myself. I'm not talking about the healthy protection of energy we need, but I'm talking about that sort of, that sense of, mm, I gotta look after myself rather than be generous with what God has given me. The question for us, I think, is whether our ambitions that we have in our lives are really for God and the betterment of the people around us or whether they're just really for us. Where does Where is the joy? The joy is in generosity, not in selfish acquisition. Generosity and humility. James chapter 4, verse 14. <laughs> Why, he says, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It's not a very flattering verse, that is it. You and I are a mist. Thanks, God. I thought you... Thought we were a bit more than a mist, uh, but he's making the point using the metaphor there that it, we don't know what's going to come tomorrow. We don't know if we will we will have a tomorrow. Our plans get upset, don't they? COVID nineteen has completely upset the apple carts. Um, things are changing day by day. Uh, I don't even know. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What the government will come out with. What will happen with vaccines or, or whatever. It's important that we don't get too attached to things. I think that's one of the things he's talking about here. It, our attachments can either create joy or limit and harm our experience of joy. If we're attached to God's love, it enhances our joy and our peace. If we're attached to things that get in the way of being attached to God, then that harms our joy and our peace. So one of the things to wrestle with in prayer, I think for me and for all of us is, what am I most attached to right now? And that might be different to you, for you and me, but it's a good, healthy thing to pray about every now and again. And ask God, reveal to me, Father, what am I most attached to? That would be helpful, I think. If we can find our attachments more with God than things, then we'll be able to enjoy more peace and God's love. Um, I'm 
in my personal Bible study at the moment, I'm focused on Psalm 23. And I'm studying it personally and enjoying it very much. I've been reading other books um, on Psalm 23, including one by Dallas Willard and um, Kenneth Bailey and a few others. And I'm thinking it's going to end up being a sermon series or possibly something like a teaching day workshop. But I've been praying about and through the themes of the psalm a lot, just just really wanting to trust that God has my back. I think that's part, really that's what the psalm is about. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And that word nothing is a bold claim. I lack nothing. Not I don't I lack I don't lack many things. There's a lot of things I have. There's some only a few things I lack. The psalmist says, I lack nothing. In other words, nothing of any importance, nothing of any significance. I have God, He's my shepherd, I have everything I need. And I find that challenging. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside quiet waters. I don't know about you, my life hasn't felt very quiet recently. He refreshes my soul guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, and we felt that a lot recently, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me, before me, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I, I could talk a lot about this, but I just mentioned one thing from towards the end of that psalm. He says, uh, surely your goodness and love will follow me. In the Hebrew, the word follow is more like pursue, more like chase after. And if you were a sheep in that um, culture at that time, you would be concerned about a wolf chasing after you or something like that. Um, but what it says here is that God's goodness and love, his hesed, they follow me. They chase after me. They're right behind me. They're protecting me, following me. God's goodness and love is chasing me down, making sure that I get safe back home to the sheepfold where the shepherd will keep me safe for the night. It's, that's how God is with us. He's chasing us through life in a way, in a positive way, chasing us, making sure we get to where we're meant to, to end up in that safe sheepfold in, in the heavenlies, in the next life. This, this, this gives us peace. Uh, our acquisitions of stuff don't give us peace. So just something to wrestle with and think about is, are we prioritizing the love of God over the love of stuff? And are we thinking about what, what's got our heart at the moment more than anything else? And the second part of the psalm, let me move on to that just for a moment. I think the second part of the psalm, which is focused on family, is really telling us that once we've got this love of God thing sorted out, that, um, that he he loves us and let's love him and let's be in that relationship with him. I think the second part of it is that people in this life matter more than stuff. Um, children are a heritage, offspring a reward, like arrows, children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They won't be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. I think it's just saying you, you, you've got a family, cherish your family. People are more important than things. Children are a gift. Children are a gift. Now, you know, we've got quite a lot of parents and grandparents here. Sometimes our children feel like a gift. Sometimes they feel like, well, I don't want to use a different word, but a, a different word um, that is not quite so positive. They're, 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 they're at least a challenge from time to time. And children, I know some of you are on the call here, and we love all of you, and we do. I and mean, your parents love you with all their hearts. There are days they struggle um, with that love. Um, you may not be aware of that, but... Um, it does happen. But children are a gift. They're not an achievement. You didn't achieve something by having children, and neither did I. I mean, well, I think the mothers who gave birth, that was kind of an achievement. I mean, that was hard work. But what I'm talking about is the making of a child. And in the making of a child, and I won't go into too much detail here on a, on a family show, but the, the making of a child um, is not, you can't really say it's an achievement. Um, you can't really say it's work, can we? I, I At least that. And so we need to remember that children are a gift. They're a gift, not an achievement. And it's important that we remember to be grateful for our family, grateful for our family, our physical family, and I would stretch it to be, to say, spiritual family as well. It's so important that we, it's so important that we delight in our family, not in their accomplishments. 
we delight in our family as people, not not the not the fact that we now have children and we've we've done something in life. Um, I was having a one of my monthly uh, Sabbath days um, beginning of this month, and I went up to Dunstable Downs, which is my favourite place to go and have extended prayer times. And in the distance from Dunstable Downs, you can see Luton, where I was born. Um, I can actually see the the factory my father worked in in 1959, 1960, around that time. Um, and I was up there. Uh, earlier this month and it suddenly struck me I'm 59 I turned 60 next February it suddenly struck me this time 60 years ago I was in my mother's womb kind of doing the maths back from February I guess my mum got pregnant in May 1960 I was born in 61 so 60 years ago at this time I existed I existed in my mother's womb, but I existed. And it just made me think about how lucky, I mean, all the circumstances that could go wrong, you know, and here, here I am, I exist, I live. Uh, it's an amazing thing to exist and to have family. Um, some of you will know my mum was in hospital on uh, last weekend. We've had a week of it. My mum was in hospital last weekend and Penny's dad was in hospital this week. They're both home now. But my mum was in hospital and because of COVID-19, uh, none of us could go and visit. So we didn't know how long she would be in. And uh, she couldn't get her mobile phone working. She wasn't charged up. Then she didn't have any credit. And then she couldn't figure out how to turn it on. Then she couldn't figure out how to answer a phone call. It was one of those, you know, things. Poor thing. Um, and eventually on, I think it was Sunday night, I finally got through to her on the phone. And we talked. And, uh, you know, just to hear her voice, knowing she'd been in hospital two or three days without seeing anybody it was just really moving to talk to her and and just, and just think about what she was going through and and to cherish her as my mother and um and then i um i was feeling quite emotional about it all and um and and she was getting a bit emotional and um and I wasn't quite sure what to do. And you, you, last Sunday, when I wasn't with you, I, I put my the song I wrote um, as a communion song. And I gather it didn't come through too well on the um, uh, through the internet and stuff. But anyway, but I decided I, I put the phone down on on speakerphone or something, and I I went to my piano and I played her and sang her the song that I wrote. And um, I think it made us both cry. Um, and but you. I, I just share that to say, you know, it's it's important we connect with our families, older, younger. It's important that we cherish people over the stuff or the lack of stuff or the ambition for stuff. People are more important. And I think as a parent, myself, and speaking to a lot of us as parents and grandparents, it's so important that our priority is to model the right way for our children to live rather than try to acquire the stuff we think they need. And we need to acquire some stuff. But more important is that we model the right priorities for our children, which includes our devotion to God. Them seeing a parent, their parents pray, them hearing their parents pray, them he seeing their parents read the Bible, talk about the Bible and talk about God and his love and his heart. It's more important than education or sports clubs. Or, And I say this not to say those things aren't significant, but just to say this is the kind of psalm that helps to think through again. Have we got the balance right here in our household? That's all really I'm saying here. Our children feel feeling loved by us. The love of God through us is more important than them getting their homework done. And I speak as a former teacher and as a child of two head teachers. Um, they need to feel that love. Home happiness is more important than home wealthiness. And I know wealthiness is not a word. But I'm making it up to make the point. Um, it's so significant that we cherish our blood family. And it's so significant that we cherish our spiritual family here. We have a wonderful spiritual family. This is the place where we can hopefully find healing. We can find help. We can find what we haven't found elsewhere in this world. And therefore, it's important at a time when we're dealing with isolation challenges that we make sure that we fight against the, the potential, at least, for personal isolation. However we manage it, whether it's physically seeing people or just seeing people online, it's so important that we connect. Whatever we have to do to connect, we need we need it. It's not so much we should do it because we have to do it, we ought to do it. It's that we just need it. We need the connection. 
So can I encourage us to think about how we can connect with our wider family? Um, so prioritizing people over stuff, just to finish off, and then we'll take bread and wine together, thinking about Jesus in a moment. This psalm goes well together as a um, kind of connected to what happened in Genesis 11 with Babel. In Genesis 11, people tried to build a tower to the heavens to make a name for themselves, and God thwarted that, not because he didn't like them, but because he knew it would harm them. The same idea, I think, is here. Unless the Lord builds the house, it's okay to build a house, but the Lord needs to be involved. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the city needs watching over it, but it needs the Lord involved. In vain we rise early, stay up late. The Lord's got to be involved. Remember Solomon. Irony is, this is a Psalm of Solomon. The irony is, he didn't live what he wrote. Just because he had the wisdom to write the truth doesn't mean he had the heart to live it. Let's make sure we're the same. We're not like that. We're, we're the opposite of that, that we have the wisdom to know this is true, but we also have the heart to get the balance of what we love and what, we're, uh, 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 what we are connected to and what we value. Let's get that balance right. How to have a healthy ambition. Love God first more than anything else and build and belong to a large and loving family. I think if we do those two things, we're going to have a healthy ambition. Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Love God first. Put him first. Have good devotional times with God, good times to reflect with God in prayer and Bible study and using other spiritual disciplines. Loving God first, and then also building and belonging to a large, loving family, physical and spiritual. These two things, if there are ambitions, they will keep us from the greater errors, at least, of any selfish ambition that may seek to creep in and corrupt our hearts and our spirits. Let's think about Jesus as we finish here, his ambitions. Gosh, the ambitions of Jesus are extraordinary, and they are, they are encased within self-sacrifice. I'm just going to read from John 10 as perhaps a summary of all this. In John 10, Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd. And of course, this connects with uh, Psalm 23. He says this, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The thief has ambition. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's the ambitious nature and the ambitious heart of our, our Lord that we love and we benefit from and that we want to be more like. The ambition to be like Jesus, who laid down his life for his sheep. We are his sheep. We're here we are. The flock, at least part of the flock that he laid down his life for. What a privilege to have that kind of shepherd. How lucky we are that somebody like that Jesus was that ambitious that he would even go to his death so that we could be saved and we could be safe and we could be well fed with what we needed. This is why we take bread and wine. We take bread and wine to celebrate and to remember what Jesus has done, how he's laid down his life so that we could have the privilege of a relationship with him. What an amazing thing. <clears throat> So as we pull our thoughts together from the psalm and that scripture, let's pray together and then take bread and wine together. Let's pray.